Good morning. I am Brad Usher, State Senator Liz Kruger's Chief of Staff. Senator Kruger is sorry she was unable to join us today. It's budget season in Albany and she has a hearing that will run all day. It's already started and will go into the night. Uh, I would like to welcome program par participants who are viewing on Zoom and Facebook or are calling in to the second session of our 2022 Boomer Senior Roundtable Series, Aging in Place, Living Well in the Community. This seven part series will focus on some of the issues we need to address to age in place. Future roundtables will focus on solar, solo agers, technology, and making your apartment age friendly. I hope you can join us again for one or more of the roundtables in the series. As always, we have closed captioning of today's event. As a viewer, you are able to activate closed captioning to view the text on your device. If you are in Zoom, click on live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. If you are in the Facebook live event, you will see a settings button in the bottom right hand corner of the video. Click closed caption CC to start viewing closed captioning. This forum is being recorded and everyone who RSVP'd will receive an email of a link to the video within a few days, along with the presenter's PowerPoints. Before we go to the program, a couple of COVID, COVID updates. If you or someone you want know wants to order the free at-home rapid test from the federal government and would prefer to order by phone, you can call 1-800-232-0233. This number was just posted in the chat as well. In NYC, our COVID-19 case rates are decreasing, but they are still at a high level and hospitalization rates are still high in parts of the state. We need to continue following COVID-19 safety measures for our safety and to help manage community transmission. NYC Health and Hospitals has a helpful facts on COVID-19 topics, including what to do if exposed, what to do if you test positive, medical care and treatment, mental health support, and COVID-related employment leave and more. The link is being posted in the chat. Now we'll move on to today's event. This morning, our presenters offer us information about advanced care planning documents. First, we will hear from Erin Shahanfar, who is a staff attorney at the Elder Law Project Public Benefits Unit at New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG. Erin will provide an overview of key documents, including information about health care proxies, living wills, power of attorney, and wills. She will also offer information about Medicaid. Next, we will hear from Margaret H. Reef, Senior Program Officer for Supportive Services at Duro, who will talk to you about how to choose someone to make your healthcare decisions when you can no longer do so and how to have that discussion. Just to remind folks before we start, you can submit questions to the Q&A functions on Zoom and Facebook. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Erin Shahinfa. Thanks so much, uh, Brad, and thank you to Senator Kruger's office for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Just one moment. Okay. Um, all right, so as Brad said, my name is Erin Shahifar. I'm an attorney at New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, and I work in our elder law practice and public benefits unit. Um, today, the topic of discussion is advanced planning tools. Just a quick word about NILAG or New York Legal Assistance Group. We are a nonprofit that provides free civil legal services to um, people who are experiencing poverty. Okay, so I'm gonna dive right in. So the, the goals for this session are to introduce you to the most common uh, advanced planning tools. And the presentation can be broken up into two pieces. Uh, the first is tools used for um, planning related to your physical being. So these are items like healthcare proxy, 
a living will, an appointment of agent to control disposition of remains. And then the second half of the presentation is gonna touch on how um, different advanced planning tools for the finance and property side of things. So this is powers of attorney, certain kinds of property ownership, trusts and wills, last wills and testaments. A useful starting point when discussing the world of advanced planning tools is uh, to think about time. When are these different tools going to be effective? So there are certain tools that are only valid during the lifetime of the person who created them. For example, a power of attorney and a healthcare proxy or living will. Those documents are only gonna be good while the person who signed them is alive. Then there are um, tools that can be used during life, or after the principal, the person who created them passed away. Those are items like trusts or certain kinds of property ownership, which we'll touch on later in the presentation. And then there are tools that are used only after death. So for example, an appointment of agent to control disposition of remains and a last will and testament. Those documents are only going to basically be effective upon the death of the person who created them. So diving right into medical advanced directives. This is an umbrella term for um, you know, different documents like a healthcare proxy, a living will, a do not resuscitate order, or a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. Uh, in this presentation, we're only really gonna touch on healthcare proxies and living wills, but I have DNRs and MULSTs up there just you know, so that you can know those documents are also out there in the world. Now, if someone does not have a healthcare proxy, um, you know, then the default, I have the default listed. Uh, there is default state law that covers, you know, who would be a decision maker for, um, you know, medical decisions. Uh, and that, that state law is called the Family Healthcare Decisions Act. And it sets out a hierarchy of different family members who would be appointed to make medical decisions for you if you were no longer able to make your decisions. So healthcare proxy document you can create to choose a decision maker. If you do not have a healthcare proxy, then Family Healthcare Decisions Act sets out default state law where a decision maker can be appointed for you. Okay, what is a healthcare proxy? This is a legal document um, that anyone age 18 and older can create. It allows you to choose a person you trust to make medical and healthcare decisions for you if you are not able to make them for yourself. So this document is only effective uh, when the person who creates it loses capacity, is not able to make their own decisions or can't communicate them. Uh, it's important for someone who's making a healthcare proxy to talk about what their wishes are, their medical wishes, um, to talk about those wishes with the person they're naming and the document to make decisions for them. And this includes you know, end of life decisions. Um, one question that comes up frequently uh, when I discuss this topic is how do you choose among your children, siblings, friends? Um, I'm just foreshadowing here. Margaret is going to talk in more depth about uh, how you can choose uh, a decision maker on a healthcare proxy. Uh, there's not really a straightforward, easy answer, and it's going to depend, um, you know, on on you. Okay, so how to complete a healthcare proxy? You can only have one proxy at a time. Um, you cannot choose your attending doctor as your proxy decision maker. You also cannot choose an employee of a hospital or a nursing home if you're a patient uh, or a resident of that facility. And if you have special instructions that you want your healthcare proxy or agent to uh, abide by, you can include those under item four. 
So a healthcare proxy is very easy to create. You do not need a lawyer to create this document. Um, you have to sign and date it before two witnesses who are over the age of 18 and um, your agent or proxy, the person you're naming in the document to make decisions for you if you can't make them yourself, that person can't be a witness. Uh, if, if someone is in a hospital that's licensed by the Office for Mental Health, they can still create a healthcare proxy, but there are special rules about who can be a witness. And I believe it's that one of the witnesses has to be a psychiatric nurse practitioner or a medical doctor. Okay, this is what a healthcare proxy looks like. There are different sections, but basically this is a pretty short, quick and easy document. Um, you can choose who you want to make decisions for you uh, when you're not able. And again, this document only covers medical decisions. And um, it just has to be signed before two witnesses who are over the age of 18 and are not the agents listed in the document. Moving on to living wills. Okay, the, a living will is not the same thing as a last will and testament. We will touch on last wills and testaments in a few slides. Uh, so a living will describes end of life wishes in the case of terminal illness or incapacity with no reasonable expectation of recovery. Um, this document is typically used to assist uh, the decision making of a healthcare proxy. Uh, and in this document, the principal, so the person who's creating it, can include their wishes with respect to, you know, artificial nutrition and hydration, CPR, help with breathing, and they can also include, you know, for example, if they have, um, you know, like religious preferences, uh, like no blood transfusions, for example, they can include that information um, in this document. A uh, living will is not a required document. It is optional, and some people who create healthcare proxies use it to help their uh, proxy or agent. I'm using those terms interchangeably. Uh, they use the living will to help the proxy or agent make decisions. Okay, expanding on what happens if you don't have a healthcare proxy. Again, the uh, New York uh, Family Healthcare Decisions Act sets out a hierarchy of people who can be appointed as a decision maker, as a surrogate decision maker in a hospital or nursing home. And I've got the order uh, you know, up on the screen. Uh, one of the limitations of this law is that it's only going to apply to hospitals, nursing homes, or actually if somebody is uh, receiving hospice care. So it's really, really important to prepare a healthcare proxy because that's going to be applicable for medical decision making in all kinds of scenarios beyond just a hospital nursing home or uh, uh, hospice care. Okay, moving on to the financial side of things, we are talking about powers of attorney. So a power of attorney is a document that authorizes a trusted person to manage finances and banking, uh, and banking matters uh, during the lifetime of the principal. So different than a healthcare proxy, which is only um, a healthcare proxy becomes effective when the person who created it loses capacity. That is not necessarily the case with a power of attorney. Um, so a power of attorney, uh, the person who creates this document isn't giving up their rights. Uh, it's basically they're just appointing someone to uh, basically be their agent when they're not there. Uh, the agent has to be a person who's over 18. And uh, this will be the next point. <laughs> which we always talk about with our clients is that this document is really powerful. It's so, so, so important that you trust whoever you're naming as your agent. And uh, Margaret, my co-presenter for this presentation is going to expand upon that topic. Uh, okay, so what's the default if you, know, you lose capacity and you don't have something like a power of attorney? 
Um, in that case, what's going to happen is, you know, your family members may need to get guardianship in order to manage your finances uh, and assist you, or there may be specific uh, ways of avoiding guardianship. Uh, it may be possible to get like a reasonable accommodation where a family member can step in for you, but it's, it's going to depend. So, uh, you know, in my practice, I am pretty much only working with uh, what's called the statutory short form of the power of attorney. Uh, there, the, the statutory short form law changed this past summer in June of 2021. Uh, and so now there's a new form. Uh, powers of attorney that were created before June of 2021 uh, are still going to be valid so long as they complied with the laws at the time that they were executed. So in a power of attorney, the agent that's the person who, um, you know, the person making the document names. Uh, the agent owes a fiduciary duty to the principal. The principal is the person signing the document. And they have to act according to the principal's instructions or their best interest. They have to avoid conflicts of interest and they need to disclose when they are acting as an agent for the principal. So for example, if they're signing a check in their capacity as an agent, they have to say, you know, they have to sign the check, James Smith, power of attorney, or they could say agent uh, for Julia Smith. A power of attorney can be revoked at any time by the principal, uh, so long as the principal is competent. And again, power of attorney, not effective after death of the principal. Okay, continuing with statutory short form, power of attorney. Principal can give broad or limited authority. This document is really customizable. The principal can appoint a monitor to oversee the agent's activities. And uh, one of the changes uh, that took place when uh, the short form changed this past summer is now financial institutions, uh, if they, so when they receive a, a power of attorney form, if they're going to reject it, they need to uh, do so in writing within 10 days of receipt. And then uh, this is just for your own information. There are other kinds of powers of attorney besides the statutory short form. They are durable, non-durable, springing. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we're just focusing on the statutory short form, which is durable. And that means that if the person who signed it loses capacity, the document is still going to be good. Here is a, a snippet of the power of attorney form. And, uh, you know, as I'm sure you can see, even though it's very small font, uh, this is the grant of authority. So the person signing this document can give their agent the ability to act for them in these different areas. So for example, banking transactions, um, they can choose some and not all, you know, they can choose some and not others. Uh, but basically, like I said, this document is really customizable. Another thing to note about powers of attorney is that uh, modifications can be added. And uh, those modifications can be used to just further tailor it to the needs of whomever is creating the document. Uh, one really important modification is a gifting. You can give your agent the power to make gifts of your property. This can be important for Medicaid planning purposes. Uh, similarly, for Medicaid planning purposes, you can give your agent the ability to create trusts. So um, that's gonna be significant because I have up there the Medicaid limits, which I'll actually get into, I think on the next slide. Um, and trusts and gifting can be used to help make people eligible for Medicaid. All right, and then a final note, executing a power of attorney requires a high level of capacity. This is not um, an easy document to create. Okay, so a word about Medicaid. Medicaid has income and asset limits that are quite low. So the income limit for 2021 is $884. 
or 13 for a single person uh, or $1,300 for a couple. Um, you know, again, a power of attorney can be an important Medicaid planning tool to help, uh, you know, give an agent the ability to uh, make somebody Medicaid eligible. And let's see, Medicaid is the only provider of free long-term care. Uh, long-term care can be provided in the community or in a nursing home. And nursing homes and even long-term care are very expensive. Uh, all nursing homes except Medicaid as payment. So Medicaid planning, really, really important. And again, can't emphasize enough that a power of attorney can be a very uh, critical tool in doing Medicaid planning. Okay, another advanced planning tool for finances is a trust. That's a whole, <laughs> trusts are a whole world in and of themselves. For the purposes of this presentation, we're kind of just flying over them. Uh, a trust is uh, an agreement that involves one or more grantors, trustees, and beneficiaries. Uh, these are some examples of trusts. There's something called a supplemental needs trust, an age terminating trust, or a pool trust. And many of you may have heard of pool trusts, uh, which are frequently used uh, to help people who are over income qualify for Medicaid. A trust can be revocable or irrevocable. Revocable just means that the person who uh, basically created the trust has the ability to make changes to it. Uh, irrevocable means that once the property is in the trust, you know, it, it can't be changed. Uh, for Medicaid planning, we're gonna use irrevocable trusts. And if you're interested in trusts, you're gonna need an attorney to help you prepare that. Okay, certain kinds of property ownership can be used for financial planning. Again, flying over this, uh, this particular topic. So, um, you know, for example, payable on death accounts, tra transferable on death accounts, accounts with a beneficiary listed, those uh, can be used to basically do some planning. Uh, joint ownership, tenancy by the entirety. Um, again, those are different items. Uh, those are different tools and kinds of property ownership that can be used for uh, planning. And again, each of these types of ownerships, uh, they're gonna have repercussions during the lifetime of the person who, you know, whose property this is. And there's also gonna be repercussions after death. Another document uh, that's frequently used is uh, an appointment of agent to control disposition of remains. This is a document in which someone can appoint a person they trust to handle burial, cremation, um, basically their remains once they pass away. They can include special instructions. And if they've pre-planned or prepaid for a funeral, they can include that information on this document. Uh, in the event that somebody passes away without uh, an appointment of agent to control disposition of remains, they there is, state law that sets out a default. And again, it's very similar to um, the Family Health Care Decisions Act in terms of the hierarchy that it sets out, where basically it's like immediate family members are going to be higher up on the list. All right, a last will and testament. Again, different than a living will. This uh, living will covers medical decisions. If you're in a terminal irreversible situation, uh, Last will and testament covers property and who gets your property when you pass it away. So, uh, you know, the, the person who signs the last will and testament is gonna choose an executor. That's the person who's gonna be responsible for distributing the property, carrying out the will. Uh, you can appoint a guardian in a will to look after your minor children if you have those. Uh, there is a right of election, basically, in New York, you can't disinherit your spouse. And the will is going to take effect when it is submitted to surrogate's court. If you would like to create a will, you're going to, you know, we recommend that you consult with an attorney. And in the event that you pass away without a will, 
Once again, state law sets out a default, which is called the laws of empestacy. And so once again, that sets out kind of the default rules for who is supposed to receive property um, in the event that someone passes away without a will. Just briefly, there are certain assets that are not included in uh, an estate. So these would not go before surrogate's court typically. That's life insurance with a beneficiary, a pension with a beneficiary, like I said, pay, uh, payable on death, transferable on death accounts, certain kinds of joint accounts, and property held jointly with a right of survivorship. Okay, so uh, just in conclusion, it's not too late to plan. Uh, planning documents should be created uh, sooner rather than later. It's a good idea to consult with an attorney. And uh, if you already have these documents, you should absolutely revisit them uh, periodically to make sure that they still capture what your current wishes are. And if appropriate, you know, it's a good idea to have a conversation with family members or people that you trust about what you want to happen uh, when you pass away. Okay, and this is my information just briefly, and I, I think it will be, you know, I'm happy to make this. Well, th my information will be on the slides, which are going to be distributed after this. So it's going to press on. Okay, thank you guys so much for your attention. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back to Brad. Thank you so much, Erin. And now we will hear from Margaret Reef. And if you can unshare your oh, slide. Yeah, there, there we, we go. go. Great. Okay, <laughs> now we will hear from Margaret Reef. Hi, everyone. Just one second here while I get my uh, screen share ready. I hope that you're hanging in there while we take in all of this information. Um, I know it can be a lot to take in at once. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay, so Choosing a decision maker, your healthcare agent or proxy. This is one We're of the most- seeing your slides, Margaret. You're not. Hold on one second. How about now? Yep. Okay. Um, and I believe you should be seeing a scene that has a slide that has three pictures on it? That's right, yep. Great, okay, so sorry about that. So choosing a decision maker um, to be your healthcare agent or proxy is one of the most important decisions that you will make um, about um, who it is that you um, entrust to decide what would happen if you were ill or injured and unable to make decisions for yourself. Um, and that it's really important to communicate what your wishes are. So one point to remember is that this is someone that would only make decisions if you had a sudden event um, and you could not make your own um, decisions or gradually that became apparent um, and was decided that um, you no longer had that capacity. You can see one of these photos um, depicts, although it's a bit blurry, um, a couple um, pointing arrows at each other speaks for me. Um, and um, that uh, may seem for people who are in a couple relationship um, as an obvious choice, but it's not necessarily the best one or the, um, or the one that you want to make in um, given the fact that what you need to ensure is that the person that you appoint as your healthcare proxy is someone that you know will follow what your wishes are, not what they think is best for you. Um, so I'll share information about how you can consider um, who you would appoint. Um, let me move on. I wanna just give you a little information about DeRote. I'm the director, um, I'm a, excuse me, I'm the Senior Program Officer for Supportive Services, and DeRote offers a whole host of, or, of 
programs and services to assist older adults. It literally translates into the word um, generations in Hebrew and was founded in 1976 by some Columbia um, college students who saw older adults in the community around them in need of help and support. So we deliver services and programs via a whole host of um, methods and these days during COVID, primarily virtually, um, we look forward to being able to return to in-person service provision. But one of the things that we think is important to reflect is that impact-wise, research has proven that social isolation has devastating effects, um, but that the power of social connection can be transformative. And we typically serve 4,000 people every year who are homebound, um, homeless, or in need of being connected to their greater community. And we match, most of, most of what we do is about matching volunteers with older adults in order to um, bridge uh, cross generations and provide meaningful connections for our clients. So your agent that you choose is someone that you need to ask, um, to determine if they are willing to serve for you. And while family partners may seem like a natural choice, it's important to talk with them about the role and whether they are willing to accept it. They need to be willing to talk with you about your goals, values, and preferences. It's important to communicate with whomever you choose so that they know what your current wishes are and any changes that you and your you have in your wishes as life circumstances change. And I'm gonna talk about the six R's later um, about times that it's really important to pause and think, is there any change that I want to make or anything that I wanna communicate differently to the people that I have chosen to um, make decisions on my behalf? The thing I mentioned earlier is that the person that you appoint as your healthcare proxy is somebody that needs to be able to honor your wishes, even if they are different from their own wishes. And I'm gonna use a personal story here. Um, so my partner's mother had a massive brain hemorrhage um, and was found um, unresponsive on the floor um, and brought to the hospital. And um, my partner's brother lives in France. And so we were at the hospital talking with a doctor who said, there's no chance, showing us the brain scans, telling us there's no chance of, um, of Lila um, uh, regaining consciousness and being able to function um, independently of machines in order to keep her alive. And when Naomi called um, Jonathan in France to say, this is what has happened. and he talked with the doctors and she got back on the phone with him and said, you know, we need to make the decision here. Um, and he said, okay, this is not the decision that I wanna make, but I know this is the decision that Lila wanted us to make, which was to not pursue any life-sustaining treatment. And she was able to die um, peacefully in the hospice, in the hospital on hospice services. Um, and it really made it much easier for, for Naomi and for Jonathan to know, because Lila had spoken with them over and over and over again, as the two people she named as her healthcare proxies, that this is what her wishes were. So um, it must, you know, it really needs to be that they, that the person that you choose or the people that you choose, because you can have a primary person, you can have a secondary person, you could choose two people to act in collaboration with each other, that, but they must understand that they are speaking for you, not for themselves. So it's also important that a person be able to uh, make decisions and advocate you for you during difficult or emotional situations. Um, often it's, a health crisis that is very sudden, that is a time in which decisions need to be made. So um, having someone that you feel comfortable with can um, still feel as feel emotions, but remain somewhat level-headed in terms of what it is that they know um, it is that you would want them to do in any given circumstances is important. And the more you share with your agent, family members, and other important people in your life, the less stress, confusion, and potential conflict they are likely to face in those instances. 
And it's really important that you make sure that you let the person know that you are identifying them as your um, healthcare proxy um, and your alternate. So there are no surprises. Um, surprises can um, lead to people being put in really difficult situations and un feeling unequipped to make decisions. Um, and if you, if you ensure that they're aware of it, um, it's important um, that let's say you were to have several children and you chose one child over another in terms of who you identified as your first, your, your primary uh, proxy, and then who would be your alternate. It's really important that there be family conversations that occur so that people are aware of this and why it is that you've made the choices that you have. Um, and um, that's something that is often hard to communicate, but it's really important to do so in order to ensure that um, that you have a that you have a way in which you have conveyed what it is that are uh, the wishes that you want. So your agent needs to be willing to accept these responsibilities. And you know, the question is, do you know someone who could do this? Who should you name? Well. We suggest that you think creatively about who might be a possible spokesperson for you. There may be some of you thinking, okay, you talked about family, you talked about friends, you talked about you know, other folks, but I, I don't really have anybody. We say consider these folks, family members, friends, neighbors, or a member of your community, someone who you may want to do the same for them. Um, that they would be willing to um, act on your behalf and you would be willing to act on theirs. It doesn't need to be someone even who lives in the same town. It can be somebody who lives at a distance, especially in today's world, given our means and abilities to communicate quickly. Um, the other thing that I would say in terms of thinking creati creatively is that we sometimes talk about, so who is it that sends you birthday cards each year? who's someone that you're always happy to see and is always happy to see you. And if you feel like you still are lacking, think about how you might widen your network of acquaintances by signing up for classes and memberships and volunteering. And don't assume, no matter who it is that you're imagining that you might appoint or whether you might make a change in who you have appointed, that someone is not willing or able to um, serve as your proxy. You'll never know until you pose the question and reminding people that it doesn't have to be, um, that, that you're choosing them because you trust that they would honor your wishes is something that often is a compelling reason for people to, to step up and feel comfortable with doing so. Stating your wishes in a written form such as the living will, um, well, the healthcare proxy form itself, and then in addition, in a living will or personal letter or video recording um, that helps to give further information to your proxy um, and your healthcare team about what you want um, to be done is important. Um, it's important to discuss and share this document with your doctor, put it in your medical record um, and make sure that people are aware of it. And one of the things that is an option, um, if you're hearing this information and you're thinking, but wait a second, how do I sort this out? How do I make a choice? Is that you can consider making an appointment um, with a What Matters facilitator to discuss this further. And this is something that I will share as a resource um, in terms of, um, of the, a resource that we offer from DeRote. So advanced care planning, it's really about the conversation. I can't stress that more, more I can't stress that enough. Um, it's you need to have it be that you share information with the actual person you appoint as your proxy and your agent, with your other loved ones, with your healthcare team, with your lawyer, and other important people in your life. Make sure your wishes are known and make sure people know that they have been documented. And you know, this slide shows that conversations can take place in a whole variety of different settings. Um, over the phone, virtually via FaceTime, in all kinds of ways, um, but that it's really important that it happen. And conversations can be casual or they could be formal with one person at a time. 
or with a group. You could have a family meeting. You could have a meeting with your friends um, who are engaged in um, your live in an active way. If you prepared written wishes, you can use them as a guide for the conversation. And we can think about how this might play out. But here's a cartoon um, that shows that, as you can see, it's not always comfortable or easy to have these discussions. You know, do you want fries, salad, or dessert, you know, on the menu in the hospital? And also, do you want life support or should we just skip it? Um, sometimes humor helps within the context of the conversation, but it's really important to have it. And it's also helpful to have it in advance of this crisis, of the time in which someone is in the hospital um, and may, um, may be feeling like it's, it's hard to imagine um, deciding what it is that they, they wanna convey as their wishes. So talking to your agent, talking to the others, and giving copies of the information are very important. Um, the more you talk, the better prepared um, the person will be. And one of the things that I wanna say is that in the, in the materials that have been created by um, a program called What Matters, it states that it's really important to think about preparing your healthcare proxy and other loved ones as an act of love, something that is helping them and helping yourself and helping to alleviate um, stress and um, confusion at the time in which they need to um, jump into action on your behalf. So some of the things that you might choose to discuss with your healthcare proxy are, what is it that's important to you to live well? When do you feel like your life would not be worth living? When would you want doctors to stop treatments that keep you alive? How would you describe a peaceful death? What does it mean to die with dignity? There are all kinds of things um, that are some guide and guiding um, questions that you could potentially use. And I can honestly say that as a person who is serving as a healthcare proxy for my 91, almost 92 year old mother, you know, I've had conversations with her about this. She didn't bring it up with me, but I've brought it up with her as the person who was appointed. And it's been very helpful for me to have a sense of what is it that's most important to her and what it is she wants at end of life. One of the things that's really important in terms of having these documents is that you need to keep a copy of your advanced directory where it can be found easily. It's not good to put it in a file that's unmarked, in a system that no one else understands. Um, some people put it on the refrigerator. Some people put it on the back of their front door. So, and it's often helpful to carry something around in your wallet or your purse. Um, it's a very important thing to take it and with, with you, take a copy with you when you go to the hospital or if you were to end up going into a nursing home, either for a short-term stay for, um, for uh, rehab or for a longer term care um, and ask that it be put in your medical record. And I'm gonna share some wallet cards that um, have been developed again through What Matters that might be things that you would want to use um, in keeping information about um, your healthcare proxy and then your living will um, on your person at all times. So, I said I would refer to the five Ds, it's actually six Ds, my apologies, but they are times when it's really important to think about, are your documents um, in order? Are there any changes that you want to make? And this would apply to healthcare proxy as well as power of attorney. So every decade, that's a good marker of a time to check. If there's a death of a loved one, which could include the death of the person that you have named as your primary or your secondary um, proxy. In the instance of divorce, if you receive a diagnosis that is um, uh, uh, causing you to think about the potential that this may be life, um, life limiting in some way. And when there's a decline in your health, I said six, but it's actually only five. This is why I'm confused. Sorry for that. So 
who can I turn to for help in making these decisions? One option is to engage with DeRote around advanced care planning. And we do this through large group programs and individual counseling. Um, and we have a team of trained and certified um, what matters facilitators um, who can guide you through one-on-one -on -one conversations in thinking about what it is um, that, that are your wishes and how you wanna convey them. As I mentioned earlier, um, What Matters developed a healthcare proxy wallet card. A little hard to read the one that's upside down, but it's um, telling, you know, this is who, this is who you are. Um, and these, this is your agent, and this is your alternate, alternate agent, and that you've had it witnessed. So when you do your actual healthcare proxy form itself, this is something that you could do at the same time. And this upside down piece says, you know, who have you given copies of this to? So it's clearly documented that you've given it to your doctor, that you've given it to your um, neighbor, you've given it to your, uh, your cousin, your brother, sister, whoever it is, um, that that's information that is known. They also created a living will wallet card. Um, and this is just saying that this is in place and that um, the following individuals have been provided with a copy and making sure that people know where they can find the living will, um, which is a document that can take various forms. We, I'm including this slide as something that you can just have in your handout. Um, that I know that um, Wendy and uh, Senator Kruger's staff will be sharing after this webinar um, to just think about some of the things that it's important to take to the hospital with you. And um, when you go, it's just something that came to mind as I was thinking about this, um, uh, this, this topic um, and some of the things that um, do relate to thinking about healthcare proxies, but also some of the other things that are important to consider. And in terms of making the decision, there's also some other um, resources that are available. One of those is called the Five Wishes, and it's an advanced care, advanced directive form that meets the legal requirements for a healthcare proxy um, in 42 states, including um, New York City. Um, and um, it addresses really walking you through thinking about what are the emotional and spiritual needs that you have in addition to your wishes for physical health treatment. And it can be used in conjunction with a um, statewide advanced care directive. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn this back over to, um, I believe Brad. Hi, yes, great, great. Thank you so much. And Aaron, if you could uh, come on too, I will uh, I'll start the question and answer period. Um, uh, I wanna thank Margaret and uh, we've received so many questions. There's no way on earth I will get through all of them, um, but the, I've shared some contact information from the organizations in the, uh, in the box. I think I may have mistyped whatmattersny.org. It seemed to come to a different website. So but if you, I did put, put Duro in there and, uh, and uh, NILAG's contact information. And when you receive the slides, you will receive additional information on the, um, on them. So if you do not get your questions answered today, <laughs> uh, these are the folks to contact. And, and certainly it's clear that both organiza organizations can provide assistance um, or direction on getting answers to questions. Um, several of you asked questions about aging in place resources. I'm including information about how to get Senator Kruger's Senior Resource Guide, which has numerous resources on aging in place and other vital services for older adults. You can access the guide online, the link will be in chat, or you can email us at lkruger at nysenate.gov or call our office at 212-490-9535 and we can mail you a copy of the guide. Some of you also ask questions about solo aging issues. We are holding a senior roundtable on March 31st, specifically on this topic. See information in chat. 
Anyone who attends the March 31st roundtable will have the option of participating in DeRoe's free multi-week course on solo aging. So you may get a taste of information here, but there's going to be a lot more of that to come. Um, now we will start with questions both set. I'm going to mix together the questions that were sent ahead of time and come in just based on sort of subject. Um, and you can continue to submit questions through the Q&A function and Facebook. Okay, I want to start with one that actually came in today, but I thought was good to get sort of clarification on why this is important. Can you tell us who make, gets to make the decisions if we have not prepared a healthcare proxy? Uh, we need to know what the default is to motivate us to designate agents. I think you mentioned the Dis Healthcare Decisions Act, but who, if I don't do it, what happens? Yeah, so it, it, exactly. If you do not have a healthcare proxy and you are in a hospital or uh, a nursing home and a decision maker needs to be appointed for you, then the Family Healthcare Decisions Act governs. And, you know, it sets out a hierarchy. I think number one was like if you have a guardian, uh, then that person uh, makes the decisions for you. If no guardian, then it's your spouse. If no spouse, then it's an adult child. Uh, if no adult child, then it's your parent. If no parent, then it's gonna be uh, an adult sibling, okay? So yeah, if you don't, if, if, you know, healthcare proxy, you get to choose who you want to make the decisions for you. If you do not have that document, Family Healthcare Decisions Act governs if um, you're in a, a, a hospital or a nursing home. Great. And we had a lot of questions both prior and uh, today about where we can get you. I provided a link for the uh, healthcare proxy, but where can you get a template for a living will, um, uh, powers of attorney and different things like that? Are, is there a good site or um, how do I do that? So uh, the Department of Health also might have a form for a living will. Uh, again, you know, a living will is kind of is, is optional. Um, it can be used to help guide a healthcare proxy. Uh, but if, if that is something that you want to do, if you have very strong uh, wishes related to like, like I said, DNR or other life-sustaining treatments that you want to spell out for your agent, uh, I think the Department of Health might have a living will form available. Otherwise, you know, what I typically do in my own personal practice, um, like I said, I, in my personal practice, I am not frequently doing living wills. Sometimes people want them. They feel very strongly about those things and they want to spell it out for their agent. Otherwise, if they don't, you can include on the healthcare proxy, I have discussed my wishes regarding life-sustaining treatment with my agent. Basically, like you're, you know, you're, you will have had that conversation with, with, your, with your agent already. Um, and then regarding a power of attorney forms. So a power of attorney, again, is a very powerful document for finances and property. And I if you have assets like real property um, or you know, different bank accounts without a beneficiary, I'm gonna recommend that you consult with an attorney. Um, who can help you do some of the Medicaid planning and help you like fully understand what the consequences or what the powers that you're giving an agent are. Um, if you do not, you know, have many assets and you want a uh, power of attorney, there is a form available for purchase on the New York State Bar Association website. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a, there are free forms available, but I'm going to direct people to the New York State Bar Association website um, because, like I said, the law just changed recently. So there are a lot of incorrect forms floating around the internet. And that was another question is the, is the short, is the revised short form or whatever it's called available online? And the answer sounds yeah. to be like, if you go to the Bar Association, it is. Yeah, for purchase, <laughs> for purchase. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, okay. Um, is it better to be general or very detailed in your living will? So I, I mean, again, I think my answer to that is if you have sort of like general, I mean, it's, it's, 
I guess if you don't have very strong feelings about these different things, then uh, maybe all you need is a healthcare proxy and then just to have a conversation with your agent. If you do have very strong specific wishes, then yeah, you should probably fill out a living will. And li most living will forms cover the items that I discussed, like, um, you know, ventilators, artificial nutrition, hydration, and, uh, you know, resuscitation. But hopefully that answers your question. So I think yeah. if you're filling out a will, a, a living will, you have to be specific, yeah, is I okay. guess my answer. Yeah, that sounds, yeah, I've got somebody ask about is a DNR the same as a living will? The answer is no, but a DNR might be something you put in your living will. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And okay. I, I would say that one thing I would refer people to if they're thinking about how they might, what kinds of questions they might want to document or engage with, um, the five wishes document that I've just put into the chat is something that could be um, a potential resource that would be helpful. And I'm looking for the living will form right now um, that I should be able to share. Great, okay. Um, and somebody asked, can I name two children as my healthcare agents? I think you answered that, but it's probably worth uh, repeating. Uh, yeah, this is an important one. You can only have one healthcare agent at a time. So you can name, you know, one child as your first choice and then the other child as your backup. But you cannot have two agents at the same time. Some states allow that, but not New York, not permitted. Uh, got it. Thank you okay. for that clarification. And that corrects what I said earlier, oh. one at a time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I'm glad I picked that one. <laughs> um, okay. Some questions about sort of the relationship between trusts and wills is please explain what a trust is and the advantage over a will. Should one have both a trust and a will? I'm trying kind of combining these. Is one a better tool to pass on to agents? I'm guessing it's probably a, it's depend answer, but. Um. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's tough. It's really gonna depend on what property you have and what your goals are. I will say that generally, Trusts can be useful for, um, they can be used for tax planning purposes. Uh, they can also be used to, for example, like protect property. If, if the person who you wanna give property to, there's like a concern that um, they may have like a lot of creditors or something like that, then a trust might be an appropriate vehicle. More appropriate than, for example, like, a will where somebody would be receiving property outright. Um, you know, it, I, I know this is an unsatisfying answer, but I think the answer to your question is just, it's gonna depend on what property you have and what your goals are for the property, like who you want to have it and kind of what, you know, like I said, your individual goals are gonna be. And do assets in a trust get probate? Correct. Yes. Another, okay. another big advantage of yeah. trust is that they do not go through the probate process. Okay. Um, I have only property. I have no property, only mutual fund accounts. I have a designated beneficiary. The answer do I still need a living will, but I think what they really mean is do they still need a will because a living will doesn't deal with these kinds of things. Yeah. So I don't, I mean, I don't want to give like individual legal advice, okay. but I guess I would say, <laughs> I would say generally, um, you know, so, so certain things like, you know, uh, pension funds and different things with beneficiaries. Yeah. Do not pass through probate. However, a will might still be useful because a will can, like I said, you know, for example, if you have minor children or something like that, you can designate a guardian in a will, if you have particularly valuable personal property, like, you know, grandma's diamond ring, or, uh, you know, this painting that's been handed down through the family, you can set out kind of what you want to happen uh, and who you want to receive property like that in a will. So it could still be useful, but it's gonna depend on your individual situation. Okay, and I think I'm gonna skip over some of these because a lot of these questions do get into sort of individual situations that you are probably not going to be able to answer. Um, there's, but there are a couple of questions about free services to create a will, like um, are there problems associated with no cost services like free will, 
uh, um, what are the advantages? What, how, I mean, I prepared a will by myself. Um, you, so I think it, it's sort of, it, I think it's possible, but are there, mm -hmm. is that a dangerous thing to do? Um, so yeah, it's, it's totally possible to prepare a will on your own. Um, I would say that, you know, one advantage, I guess, of going to an attorney is that you can also get, you know, you could consult about kind of like Medicare planning, um, and they could help you do some kind of planning like that. And also an attorney would be able to help you talk about like different vehicles that would avoid probate, um, which, you know, I personally have never used the free will website, although I am familiar with it. And um, yeah, you know, I guess I would say practitioners are, di are divided. Like on the one hand, it's great that this is available to people and that people can prepare it. I would say that if you have a lot of property or complex property, or there's any concern about you know, people being upset about what you set out in your will, uh, then it might be a good idea to consult with a lawyer. Yeah. Or if like, I, I, I'm too young to have to worry about Medicaid planning at this point in time, but, but it might be a different, it might not be a good idea for me to prepare my own will if I was looking at something like that, because there might be better ways to do it. And um, if, a, if someone passes away, Without a will, but has beneficiaries, beneficiaries listed, their assets will be. New York State will abide by what is listed. Is that correct? So this person is talking about Vanguard, but I would assume it would oh. be for any. So I, 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 I have an account. I've listed person X as my beneficiary. I don't have a will. Yeah, I would say that that is the general rule. That um, yes, if you have a beneficiary on an account then it avoids probate and it goes to uh, the beneficiary and they're they're just going to need a death certificate in order to collect. Okay. And um, I, I've got uh, now moving on a little bit to power of attorney. There's been a number of questions that are, what are the pros and cons of a sprung POA? What's, what's, is there, there's something called the durable power of attorney? How does this differ, differ from a basic power of attorney? I'm not sure if those are things that you can answer in a short <laughs> bit, but give it a try. <laughs> give it a try. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, uh, so a durable power of attorney just means that if the person who signed the document loses capacity, the document is still good, like still valid. That person is still able to make decisions for the person who signed it. A non-durable means that the document dies when the person who signed it uh, loses capacity. And then a springing power of attorney means it's just a power of attorney that becomes effective on an event. So technically, a healthcare proxy is a springing power of attorney. And in other states, they're called medical powers of attorney, um, you know, and the event that triggers it is loss of capacity, uh, which is certified by a doctor. So that's kind of the, the, the different buckets of uh, powers of attorney. Great. And Justin, uh, if you could repost the NILAG in contact information, again, it, we will be sharing these slides with everyone. The contact information is in there, but I do have a couple of requests for reposting the stuff I posted earlier. Um, okay. Um, and you, okay, we talked about forms. Um, and again, if, if people want to see the forms, we're sharing some links to the forms, but also the organizations like if you, I, is it correct that if I go to What Matters, they're going to be able to talk to me, talk me through this and talk to me about specific forms, Margaret? Is that an accurate statement? Or maybe talk more about what would happen if I made an appointment with What Matters? Yeah, so in contacting What Matters, um, we will probably be holding our next um, um, group session in April, um, actually after the Aging Solo um, session webinar that is one of my um, co-workers is going to be presenting here um, at a roundtable. Um, and you can certainly call 
uh, contact us around making an individual appointment. I do want to warn people that we have a bit of a wait list, um, but we do get to um, get to having the conversations with folks. Um, and um, your question was about how do I choose the forms, Brad? Yeah, well, uh, it's about what I think the question is, I, I think the the question is more, I don't know what forms I need because I haven't seen the forms. Okay. Um, so is that, do you go through like discussing a power of attorney as potential necessity or do you, the question about, can I just get by with a healthcare agent and a living uh, and a healthcare, a healthcare proxy or do I need a living will? Those kinds of questions. We certainly talk about the, um, the components of um, healthcare decision-making and um, help to guide people to um, think about where they might um, make a connection for um, uh, uh, meeting with an attorney around the um, power of attorney or setting up a last will and testament. Um, and we do have resources that we can share in that regard. And I did find the document that I was looking for. Um, AARP actually um, provides a resource um, by state for um, New York for advanced directives. And I have the one for New York that I will Great. share with your office so that it can get sent to the folks who participated today. Great. Okay. So more on that and, and you can reach out. If you, if you have patients, you can reach out to what matters and, <laughs> and eventually you'll get an appointment and you can go through mm -hmm. this stuff with more of the sort of individual questions we're getting. Um, actually, I want to go back to a question about, because um, this is something that affects a lot of our constituents. Can you create a a, a trust for a co-op in Manhattan? Does anybody know the answer to that or is that? I, I frequently uh, get that question in these presentations and uh, there it's, I, I mean, there's no sort of like general rule. Uh, it's gonna depend on the bylaws of the co-op. So I would say that that's a good starting point is to find out what the bylaws are for your co-op. Okay. And Sounds like you probably need a lawyer to do that. <laughs> you yeah. can ask. You can ask your co-op for a copy of your bylaws if you don't yeah, have no, a copy it, of them. Yeah. But, um, in terms but in order to set up a trust, trust it may need to be consulted with an attorney about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some co-ops um, can be put into a trust. Some cannot. Okay. Um, with an estate, must there be an executor for the state estate, and must they be compensated? And are there amounts they must be compensated? So there, um, so if you're creating a will, yes, you're appointing uh, an executor. And even if you don't create a will, uh, then the court's going to appoint what's called an administrator. So there's going to be somebody who is responsible for gathering up the property of the estate, paying off debts, and then distributing any leftovers to um, the people who are supposed to get it. Uh, there is no requirement to, if, if you're creating a will and you've named an executor, there is no requirement to compensate them. Um, it's going to be up to the person signing the will. And um, yeah, they're, 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 you're not required to compensate them. And in the wills that I draft, frequently it's family members who are the executors and they're serving without receiving compensation. Okay. Um, what kind of document is needed for relative or friend to continue to take care of person's affairs after death, such as banking, rent, bills, etc.? POA is for help while person is still alive. Is there something that somebody should be doing for that one? Yeah, I mean, that would be a reason to write, to, to draw up a will. Um, you know, you drop a will and you choose who you want to be the executor, and that person is going to be then responsible for winding up the affairs. Of the person and, who died. and if someone has already reached a point where they're incapacitated, I mean, let's say that they've got a power of attorney, a, a sprung power of attorney, and they don't have it, they don't have it made arrangements after death. Is that kind of like too late or? Uh, so if, if so, if somebody dies and they don't have a will, then what's going to happen is then the surrogates court for the place where they live is going to appoint an administrator. So the court is going to appoint someone who's then responsible for dealing with all the uh, property and and other things. 
Okay. Um, and then somebody's got a question about with all of these documents, what if there's a family risk, distrust or disagreement with daughters, sons-in-law, if there are multiple siblings, how can we control for that? Um, Margaret, I feel like maybe Margaret has some, some thoughts on this. Yeah. So one of the things that is um, part of thinking carefully about who you choose to name as either your power of attorney or your healthcare proxy is um, identifying the person who you feel is um, best equipped to follow your wishes and act on your behalf. Um, it is not uncommon that there are conflicts within families. Um, I think that one of the things that can be helpful is that knowing that let's say you have, you know, you have several children um, and you're very clear that you want to name this person, you know, your son, Eric, as your primary, um, your, your first, uh, and then as your agent, and then you want to name, uh, you know, Kathy as your um, alternate, um, it's probably going to be helpful to them as the people who have been named that you've communicated it to all the children just to say, look, I've made a decision and it is to do X. And if you wanna argue about it, argue about it with me. Not, this is, cause this isn't up for grabs. This is a decision that I have made. I've thought carefully about this. And um, you know, this is what I feel most comfortable with. It really is about engaging candidly and thinking about um, how you voice what your decisions are to family and friends and, you know, others who are important in your life. Um, that that's one of the ways that you can help to address it. Um, you can't take away the conflicts. If you don't name anybody, if you stay immobilized and you don't choose to name one of your children as your healthcare proxy or someone else as your healthcare proxy, then it is that it ends up being that there's a free for all around whose wishes um, end up being followed. And often um, if you're, let's say in a hospital, an ethics panel might be brought in to help to make determinations. So it's really in your best interest. Um, I did these documents for myself many, many moons ago and I continue to update them on a regular basis because I know that I don't want it to be that there's any potential for um, there to be conflict. Um, of it, you know, because I there's there's issues within my family. So I just want to know that this is what the plan is going to be, and that it's clear. Um, and I've let my I've let people know that you know on I've not chosen. I've told my brother I've not chosen him to be one of my proxies, um, and you know he's he's kind of like okay, um, but I because I know that he wouldn't you know, he goes with the do everything you possibly can route. Um, and that's not what my wishes are. So um, I hope that helps answer the questions. You, you're in control. It's never too early and it's never too late to, to start with, um, you know, setting up these plans and creating these documents. Um, you have to take control of your aging or it's going to take control of you. Um, these are mantras that come up actually within our aging solo um, seminar, um, but they're really important to keep in mind. And a lot of this is about living and making sure that you are learning about what your options are and you are implementing plans and you are voicing your decisions to the people that you care about and that you're engaging in your life um, to improve end of life um, care for yourself and for others. Right. No, I, I think that these documents are important in any circumstance, but they're even more important if you've got conflict between family members or you've got family members or others who you don't think are actually going to follow your, your wishes, that if you've spelled it out, you've got legal protection and there's not a lot that that person is going to be able to do to challenge it. So. And I, I can think of an instance in which someone did not have a proxy named, but they had a living will. And so my organization was familiar with the individual who we served. We had a copy of the living well. They were hospitalized in an emergency in ICU. 
on all kinds of life sustaining equipment. Very clearly stated in their living will, do not do this. We brought the living will to the hospital um, and they took it to their, after, after allowing a period of time to see if there might be possibility that she would recover, um, they actually took it to their um, panel and made the decision to, you know, take that person, that individual off life support, which is what she wanted. Wow. Um, so I can give you that example as well, is that sometimes even if you don't have someone to appoint, making sure that people have and know about, you know, take my living well, please. Yeah, um, and that's a great, great answer for the fo folks concerned about solo aging and, you know, if hopefully uh, thinking creatively, you can find somebody to be your agent, but mm -hmm. if you can't, you still, there are still ways to protect yourself with a living will. Great. And you okay. need to give it to your doctor. Uh, there's another point that I would make is that if you only are going to have a living will and they are going to look at you like, why do I need this document? And you just say, I need this to be part of my medical record. If you go into the hospital for something, you'd say, I want this to be part of my medical record. So. Okay. Moving on to Medicaid, a couple of questions. There was a, about web, the Medicaid income limits. I think you were putting up monthly numbers, but if you can clarify maybe the, what the limit is by month and or by year, um, just so folks understand what the limits are. Yeah, sorry, that is correct. They're monthly. So it was 884 per month in income for a single person. And then um, the other one, which I'd have to open my presentation really quickly was uh, was for also monthly and that okay. was for two people. Right. So when we send you the slides, just know that that slide is referring to monthly, monthly uh, monthly levels. Um, if, if my husband and I have to go into a nursing home, does Medicare pay for it? If not, w do we have to apply to Medicaid? Also, if you can speak about the five year look back and what is the dollar amount they cannot touch, is it still 16,000? And then somebody else asked, has the two and a half year community Medicaid look back period made law in New York State? Can if, so if you can touch base on those, if you know those numbers. Yeah, I, so I would say that um, Medicare, my understanding is that Medicare pays for, um, you know, nursing home for a short period of time, but for long-term care, uh, Medicaid is going, is basically the provider of that. Um, so that's, you know, why Medicaid planning is so important and such a like primary consideration for people when they're preparing these documents. In terms of some of like the look back period and different issues like that, I, if you have, you know, Medicaid specific questions, like it is completely possible to do an hour long presentation just on Medicaid alone. I think that it might make sense for you. You can feel free to call NILAG and, um, you know, we'd be happy to talk more in depth about some of the different, you know, look back issues and, and more kind of like of the nitty gritty involving Medicaid. I will just say like kind of briefly, Medicare, you know, is not going to cover long-term care in a nursing home. Right, okay. Um, okay, let's see if I, if I made it through most of my questions, but then there's 41 new questions that have come in. Um, uh, can you have a third proxy? Um, so I think you could. Uh, the form that I use in the Department of Health form um, that's available for free on the website just has two. So it's basically, you know, your first choice, your proxy, and then one backup. But I think theoretically you could have uh, you know, if you wanted to set up a third choice, I think you could do that. And, and I think there were, there, I, we got a couple of questions about witnesses. Um, there, it, for a POA, it's two witnesses. Is that, that's standard for most, I know that's right for a, yeah. uh, for a healthcare proxy. And yeah, so healthcare proxy is two witnesses mm -hmm. and a power of attorney is two witnesses, and if you're creating the statutory durable form, it's got to be signed in front of a notary public as well. Okay, that was another question about what needs to be notarized. So uh, a, a healthcare proxy doesn't need to be notarized, but a durable power of attorney does need to be notarized. Correct, okay. yes. Okay, and um, somebody says, I'm always losing papers. Is a photo of the document stored on a cloud legal, or do my heirs need the original document? So, um, a copy is 
fine for the most of the advanced directives that we talked about today. A copy is not fine for your last will and testament. Uh, New York courts, you have to submit the original. Um, and, you know, so, so, that, so that, that hopefully answers the question. A copy is good for pretty much everything except, except. for a last will and testament. And so if you, um, you know, lose documents, maybe it makes sense to give your agent that original document and you okay. keep a copy yourself. Okay, and this one is about wills, but it probably applies to just about everything. An attorney made a will for me 10 years ago. Recently, the attorney passed his way as well as one of the, or all of the witnesses. How does this affect the new will if a new one, the will if a new one is not made? And this sounds like it might get into the question of when you need to, when you need to review your documents. If your witnesses have passed away, perhaps that's when, I don't know. Um. So I would say that that shouldn't affect the validity of the document if they signed um, an affidavit, which, um, you know, I, again, like, I don't want to get too deep into somebody's individual legal situation, but I guess generally the death of the witnesses, you know, if they signed an affidavit saying that, you know, they witnessed the will and, um, that shouldn't necessarily uh, affect its acceptance. Um, more important, I think, for people here is to look and make sure that uh, the will still represents your wishes <laughs> as they currently are. If you have questions about the validity of a will, you can feel free to contact us. And we would you know, have to take a look at the document. And then we can kind of give you more specific advice from there. If, if you're concerned about it being accepted by the court. Um, but I would say that generally, uh, you know, that's that. So yeah, if you're, if you're concerned about it being accepted by the court, contact us, we can take a look at the will and give you more specific advice from there. Um, but otherwise, just make sure that the will, if it's older, still represents what you want to happen. And actually, I've got a couple of questions that came in at different points about posts and molsts and how they relate to these documents. Um, perhaps that may be our last question, but I know that there's always confusion about, and I'm not even sure if, the, if we have both of those in New York, or, um, but could somebody talk about posts and mosts and what they are in relation to the documents we've been talking about? Yeah, so uh, a most is going to cover... So it's, it's similar to, um, to a living will, but it, yeah, is kind of like more tailored about life-sustaining treatment. Um, and I would be happy to provide, the Department of Health kind of breaks down molsts and pulsts, and there's, you know, some more in-depth information about those and when you might want to use those. And I'd be happy to share those uh, links with uh, you know, Senator Kruger's office so that they can be shared to the Great. attendees. Great. That would be perfect. We can then include those with when we send out the slides and, uh, and the link to the overall presentation. Well, I and, think... Oh, go and ahead. I have actually um, a section that I'm going to send from our Aging um, Alone Together. Um, that uh, program that has um, resources and it includes um, the most, um, which I have put into the chat as well. Great, and if you can include, we'll include all the links from today's event in the, uh, in the uh, when we send out the post event uh, email. So uh, if you missed a link, you can, you'll be able to get it there. Well, I Definitely. want to thank thank you both, Erin and Jane. Um, very informative, and obviously, covering this subject in a, in in an hour and a half is a is a real challenge. But you gave us a lot of information and a lot of resources where we can look for more things if we need them. Uh, our, our next senior roundtable session will be held on February seventeenth, and is titled "This Is Living: The Age Friendly Home," and will will include information on making your apartment age friendly. Continue to wear a mask in public indoor settings and get vaccinated, including booster shots. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, guys.